Yo, yo, yo. Hey guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. My name is Kirk Barron. My goal is to bring you the best thinkers, the best teachers in all of dentistry. And today we do just that with one of the best of all time, Deborah Engelhart Nash. And today she shares her concept of the recall renewal exam. It is awesome. And she'll help you think better and your team think better about the patients you already have in the practice. So make sure you listen up. I know you guys will enjoy it and we'll see you soon. Welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. I am like a kid in the candy store. You know why? Because I get to hang out with crazy, brilliant people, and I get to ask them questions, and you're going to see, they just bring great, great knowledge, like the guest I have today, who is just one of the best of all time, Deborah Engelhart Nash. And um, today we're going to be talking about one of those things where everyone's kind of struggling with is the recall renewal, you know, optimizing the patience of record. But I want to say this about you, Deborah. Deborah, first of all, thank you for being on. I appreciate you. Pleasure. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I'm going to rave about you for a second or okay. two seconds. But all uh, right, I'm ready. As rave a coach, away. okay, as a coach, like you've got your handful of people that number one, they're just brilliant and they're willing to help you. That is definitely Deborah. Number two, they're absolutely hilarious and you enjoy hanging out with them. That is definitely. Deborah, like it's so much fun. And then also just her willingness to bring new insightful thoughts to help the next generation or any generation of dentists succeed. That is totally you. So I'm just so grateful to call you my friend. Um, I don't, I don't even know where we're going to go today. I know where we're going to go today, <laughs> but you guys are in for a treat if you're listening to this. So Deborah, I want you to do a little bit of intro because we have a lot of young listeners. If they've never heard you before, like who, who's Deborah Engelhart Nash? Who are you? Oh my gosh, isn't that, it's kind of scary. You know, Kirk, you and I have been in the industry for, I don't know, well over 30 plus years. And I'm thinking, who hasn't heard me? But I suppose some of the younger people coming in would be like, who are the old, who, who, who's this old person? Um, I was helping a speaking, a speaker working on coaching her. She's getting ready to, to do, uh, go into a speaking competition. And I said, oh my gosh, you've been in, in, in the industry for a long time. And she says, don't tell people how long, because then they're going to think I'm irrelevant because I'm old. I don't know. There's a lot to be said for that. So yes, I have been in a uh, consultant since the uh, mid eighties. I started my own company. I worked for a major consulting firm, Pride Institute, um, until 1985 when I started my own consulting company. And here I am to this day, still consulting and speaking and coaching and teaching. And uh, I lived in, born and raised in California, lived in Seattle, married a Southern ball dentist and moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, um, which was not, a, a, even in my, my wildest dreams, I ever thought I would do that. And together we developed also a training center, the Nash Institute for Dental Learning. My husband's Dr. Ross Nash just won the Lifetime Achievement Award at yes. the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Well-deserved. Well-deserved. Um, yes. And so he teaches clinical courses at the Nash Institute. I teach business courses at the Nash Institute. Uh, because here's my contention. You know, I've talked about this before. It's one thing to know how to do the dentistry. It's another thing to know how to talk about it and get your patients to say yes to it. Those are different skill sets. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have a great clinician who's not a great communicator. And sometimes you have a great communicator who's not a great clinician. Clinician, If you can, if you could marry the two um, and have a hybrid, that's, that's the best of all worlds. So that's what I work on. That's what I work on is how you, how you help. Um, I mean, I coach doctors on how to be um, more personable, if you will, how to get your patients to say yes and getting the teams involved in helping them understand and appreciate the role that they play in moving to treatments. I, I had the pleasure of co-speaking with one of our dear friends, Samir, from Care Credit, yeah. 
yeah. on Saturday. And he was talking about the difference between recommended and accepted treatment. But he's talking, he talked about, you know, the whole idea of even talking to patients about money is it's a team event. It's everybody's, everybody's involved. So that's sort of what I do. I've been doing it a long time uh, and I still love it. My friends keep asking when, I, when I'm going to retire. And I say, why? Because I'm, no. you know, why would I retire? I'm having a blast and I'm helping people. And, you know, I sort of, Emil Zola said one time, I came to live my life out loud and that's me. I came to yeah. live my life out loud, no matter what I do. Well, you are definitely doing it and you cannot retire because it's so much fun. I, yeah. <laughs> I like you guys that are listening to this, you're going to learn so much. You're going to learn like, she's just so good at crafting, not only the thinking, but also the words and um, the knowledge and the know-how. And today, like uh, you brought this up, we, we're, you and I are going to cover a lot of topics in future podcasts, but today we're going to be talking about recall renewal. Let's talk about the why. What's the real problem? Well, here, here's what inspired me to really focus on this. Um, I got, I, uh, and you are the math guy. You know, I would rather stick a pencil in my eye than do math, but I do math. I have to do math. I do it. But I heard this statistic, which I thought, holy cow. So the statistic is that the average treatment acceptance rate for new patients is, any, is between 70 and 78%. I mean, when dentists say they get 100% treatment acceptance rate, they're, they're fooling themselves. They're, right. you know, that's not true. I mean, if you want to dummy down, if you want to talk about your, your phase treatment plan or your modified treatment plan, and if you want to inflate your statistics to make yourself feel good, but that's, you're, you're not going to get 100 if you're presenting comprehensive treatment plans, you're not going to get 100%. So right. there's a statistic, but here was the statistic that really caught my ear. And it was that for recare patients, the treatment acceptance rate for recare patients is between 25 and 35%. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. See, uh-huh. Okay. Uh -huh. You do. That's when you go, uh-huh. Why is that? Well, that Why? was, a good, what's your hypothesis? Uh, oh yeah. It's <laughs> I, here's my hypothesis. I'm leaning back oh. in my chair. We're not spending enough time talking to our patients of record about treatment. We're just not doing it. Or here's one of my, I actually, I have a, on a slide when I do this program in live and I have my presentation um, and here's my quote, familiarity sometimes breeds apathy. Familiarity breeds apathy. So Kirk, if you're my patient, I say, oh, I know Kirk, he's not interested. He, he His insurance won't cover it. We've talked about those two crowns before. He doesn't want it. Um, I, don't, I don't want to offend him. So that's one reason that we say, oh, Kirk's not interested. Kirk doesn't want it. I've already spoken to Kirk. 17 years ago, I told Kirk he needed those two crowns. And every time he comes in, I say, you know, Kirk, you know, you, knew, you, know, you need those crowns. And you go, I know. And they go, okay, I need to clean your teeth. The other piece of that is, um, but we don't give the hygienist enough time to have conversations with their patients. So right. timing is everything. So sometimes doctors, and I say this lovingly and, and half in jest, but sometimes doctors brag about how little time their hygienist needs to be effective. And I go, wait a minute, how are you determining effectiveness? Is it how, what is their, what's their production per day? Or is it not only what is their product production per day, but what additional treatments was diagnosed and accepted out of their out of their treatment room, out of their operatory? So we have to take a look at both of those things. I mean, I could have a great perio hygienist, and maybe he or she is not getting a whole lot of, of treatment acceptance out of their, their operatory, because that's not what they were designed to do. But if I have maybe a, a hygienist who's seen general care patients, then I want to take a look at what additional treatment is being accepted out of out of that room. So I, you know, I go into some offices and doctors will say, my hygienist can see 12 patients in a nine hour day. And they're not pedo, they're not children. <laughs> and I say, great, but what's your treatment acceptance out of from those nine people? Yeah. And there was a hygienist who said one to me, she kind of sort of crossed her hands and she said, I am not hired to sell dentistry. I am hired to clean teeth. Wow. We have a problem. We do. We we do. And the problem's got many layers to it too. So, okay. My, I just, I just had a visceral reaction when you said 12 patients in one day, one of the biggest problems in the universe is finding great people. And if I'm a great hygienist, he or she, I don't want to be like hammering out patients. Do you agree? Yeah. So here's, that's the reality. So you're thinking, you know, my, if, if, you know, you, you want me to churn and burn? 
I mean, I am not, that's not the place I'm going to want to go. I'm not going to want to be. And you usually say, well, what if you had a hygiene assistant? That's a whole other topic. I mean, can we do 12 patients a day with a hygiene assistant? Maybe we could do 10. It depends on, are we going to have a lunch hour? But it goes back to my, my situation. What kind of conversation are we having with um, these patients who um, are coming into the office? So I think timing is, timing is another thing. I think once again, familiarity. I think I, I think I know the patient is too interested. So here's one of the thing, my other one of my quotes, I have lots of them. You do. Um, I love it. Um, any strength taken to excess becomes a weakness. Ooh, tell me more. Go back. Any strength taken to excess becomes a weakness. That's why, that's why I don't diet. Um, you know, <laughs> I, mean, because I, I was can looking become anorexic. Well, I was looking really for a clinical well. example of that, but like, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, so, so here's, here's, I will, here's a story. This is a great, a great illustration. So my former husband, John lives in Seattle, Washington. He goes to a friend of mine. He goes to somebody I know. I haven't seen this person for a number of years. And, and I live in Charlotte and we're friends. So John calls me one day and he says, Deborah, um, I need to call uh, Don's office because I need to talk to them about my dental bill. Will you walk me through this? <laughs> I said, sure. And I said, what is it? And he said, I got charged for a recall exam. And I said, uh, well, John, did Don come into the room while you were there? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, did he have some little point pointy instruments in his hands and he went into your mouth while you were there? And he said, well, yeah. I said, did he, did he kind of poke around a little bit? And he said, Deborah, he said, he asked me about you and Ross and Sophie. He asked me about the film I was working on. We talked about where I live because he lives at the beach. He said, Deborah, at the end of the day, that was a social call, not a recall visit, not a recall exam. It wasn't a dental, it wasn't a dental exam. It was a social exam. It was a social call. Right. And I went, Eureka, how many times do we say, oh, Kirk, I know you and you want to talk about running and you want to talk about your kids and you want to talk about church and you want to talk about food and you want to, so we have these wonderful social conversations about all of these things. And, um, my husband just walked in on us, whatever that flash was, that was, you know, he doesn't realize we were recording. So we have, so we, we're, you, you and I are friends now and we, maybe we go to the same church. So now I spend 45 minutes or 50 minutes. We have a social conversation and then the doctor comes in and he or she does, you know, Hey, everything looks great. And how you doing? And how are the kids, what's going on? You know, and everything looks good. We'll see you next time. And I'm out the door. Yeah. Absolutely. It happens all too often. All I, the time. All I think the it, time. I think you nailed it with the apathy thing too. You already, you're already telling your story, yourself a story before you walk into the opera. Well, here's the other thing. It, it, we don't intend to be apathetic, but once again, I, I may look at your record, hopefully in the morning huddle, I'm looking at Kirk's information. I'm looking at what, and, and if I'm using Pearl, I'm seeing what radiographs are due. By, for, for my patients coming in. So I'm ready for you to come in. But I'm also could say, I know Kirk. He's not interested. He doesn't want it. He's not going to do it. So we're not going to talk about those crowns. And sometimes we even coach the new hygienist coming in. We say, don't talk to Kirk about flossing. He doesn't want to talk about flossing. Don't ever talk to him about flossing. He hates talking about <laughs> flossing. Don't talk to him about home care. He just doesn't like to have that conversation about home care. And like, so now we train our successor possibly in some of our bad habits. Yeah. So yeah. it might be, so I think a couple of things, I think it's timing as well. You talk about some of the other factors. Sometimes we ask the patient at the end of the visit. So first of all, if you already had to wait for the doctor, Kirk, for the, for the exam for 20 minutes, and then you, you're going to sit and listen to the doctor and the hygienist talking about um, unscheduled treatment or treatment that has just been diagnosed or treatment that has been previously diagnosed. I, I need to get my kid to the soccer game. I need to get out of here. Right. So timing is also really important. Right. I think the other piece of this is, you know, we talk we talk about um, new patients being VIPs, and we talk about how we're going to razzle and dazzle them. What about our patients of record? What about those patients who've been true blue loyal to your practice for 15 years? So that is when I came up with I what I can I call the recall renewal exam. A lot of my friends heard me say it years ago. I remember Kathy Jamison hearing me say it at an ADA meeting in Seattle in 1995 and said, oh my gosh, I'm using that, um, which is great. But I yeah. think, I mean, and I, and I think once again, if we, if we sit down, there's um, the most important question that a hygienist will ask 
uh, patient and when she or he asks it, that's critical. And also, you know, if we start doing some math on what this could look like, I mean, even if we had 10% of our patients of record move forward with some level of, uh, level of treatment, what that would do to our practice productivity. Yeah, it's incredible. So I want you to walk me through the thinking because I love that term, recall renewal exam. Okay. And walk, like if I've never heard this before, walk me through it. How right. does it work? How do I think? So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about why do people renew their wedding vows? What's the, what's the objective of renewing other than more jewelry, bigger jewelry, maybe bigger ring, more carrots. I don't know. Why do people renew their wedding vows? To re-energize, to re-emphasize, to give, to give that, that feeling that you had when you started it, bring it back. To recommit. Right? To recommit. absolutely recommit. Yeah. So funny story about that. So Ross and I were married 19 years. We were at our location where we honeymooned and Ross's, um, he said, Deborah, this experiment seems to be working. And I think next year we should come back here and at our 20th anniversary and renew our vows. And I said, listen, my husband cries at Budweiser commercials. Okay. You know, the, with the dogs and the horses. And <laughs> I said, um, Ross, are you kidding? I mean, you, you really want to do this? I, I, I said, you want to renew our vows? Yeah. And Ross said, you know, Deborah, most women would be weeping right now. And I said, Okay, you know, if you want to renew our vows, all right, but I'm not doing it on the beach where people are walking their donkeys and they're selling you ganja and their little bikinis and you find me a little quiet spot, and, you know, in this tropical setting. I'll, all right, okay, I'll do it. I'll tell you what, what? it was pretty magical. It yeah, was what? pretty cool. My first thought is, what beach are you hanging out with? Yeah, like, I want to. <laughs> it was in the grill, Jamaica, <laughs> and I mean, I I felt like a brand new bride. I That's cried. Awesome. It was beautiful. It was touching. It was loving. It was re. I mean, it was once. It, it was everything the, that the wedding was. It was this re-promise to one another, and I went, bingo. We need to be re renewing our relationship with our patients of record. So if you were my patient, Kirk, for 10 years, I am assuming that the relationship or the, the new patient experience you had 10 years ago is probably different than the, the new patient experience that I'm providing today. And there were probably things we talked about 10 years ago that we, uh, that we, didn't, we, didn't talk, we don't talk about now. And, and I don't want to see you as just Kirk. I don't want to see you as just another recall, just another cleaning. I want to reinvigorate my relationship with you. I want to re-engage. I want to reignite. I want to re-inspire you to be a part of my practice. I think about, I would, I'm, I'm hesitant to talk about hair, Kirk, with you, but hair. Yeah. I mean, sometimes people change hairdressers. You wouldn't know about this, but we no. change hairdressers. Because sometimes we think that maybe the person who's doing our hair, who's been doing it for years, says, do you want the same haircut today, Deborah? Do you want the same haircut? Do you want to do anything new? And I say, why don't you introduce me to something new? Why right. don't you ask me if I would be interested in something new? Why don't you revisit what my objectives are with my hair? I mean, so I'm thinking that we really need to go back with you, Kirk, my patient. And I might say, you know, Kirk, you've been a patient in my practice for 12 years. Wow, has right. it been that long? It has. Yeah. Here's where we were. Here's where we were when you came to when you were when you were a new patient. Right. And here's what we've done. Here's what we've done so far. Here's what here's where we are now. Yeah. Let's talk about where we are now. Let's talk about your dental future. Let's talk about where we where we want to go, where we're going, where we want to be. Yeah. But I also want to re I want to remind you of our of our treatment philosophy. I want to remind you of our culture. I want to remind you of the quality of care that you have received in the past. Um, so it's not just a recall. In fact, right. sometimes we use that term. Hi, Kirk, this is Deborah from <laughs> Dr. Smigley's office. I'm just calling because it's time for your recall. It's just a recall. And yeah. sometimes patients will call and say, I'm, just, I'm calling to cancel my appointment. It's okay. It's just a recall. It's just my recall. Hey, anytime you recall a vehicle, that's bad. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Like, yeah. So, you know, so when we, when we, when we recall the patient, we need to tell them why they're being recalled. We're bringing you back because. Right. Now, fact, one more, I love yeah. this. I love this. So think about this. If you're listening, like the, the relationship is dynamic. You as a clinician have changed over the last 20 years. You're going to education. You I see hope so. I, I hope, hope so. so. The patient also changes. Like I've got wear now and I've got other things that are influencing me. So 
And can you imagine a world where there was no standard of care, even in mammograms or in, um, you know, across the board, there's certain things we got to do to make sure that you're healthy, that, you know, we're on the proactive side of things, you know, yeah. so a col even a colonoscopy, get... like at a colon, what if I was your doctor and I was like, ah, you look good. Don't worry. We don't need to do a colonoscopy. Like, yeah, yeah. It'd be terrible. Yeah. I mean, don't you? we say that, um, you know, it, it, it sucks to get old. It's the alternative is worse. Right. Um, For sure. Yeah. But, and I, one of the things that I might say to my pay, my, my, my elderly patient, my older patient, I'm one of those, I'm an older patient you might say, you know, Deborah, your dental care is even more important than it was when you were younger. There are so, so many systemic causes that we're discovering with dental health that it's going to be even more critical for you to be on a more frequent, frequent appointments with us, because we want to make sure that your system, your oral health is part of your systemic health. And that's critical um, as we age. So, so those are some of the things, but I think that that's important that we, and I also want to take a look at, I may have told you five years ago that you needed crowns and you said, no, I need to find out. And here's my, here's my, here's the magic. Here's the million dollar question. This is the million dollar question Come. and it's timing. And I'll tell you, hygienists say, oh my gosh, Deborah, I use this all the time. And rather than saying, well, you know, Kirk, we've talked about those crowns before. He's probably going to come in. I want to talk to you about those crowns. Are you interested in those crowns? Um, and you say, no, it's not hurting me. Okay, great. Shut up. I need to clean your teeth now. I've got to do this. <laughs> now I've got to do all this other stuff. I've got to do this pearl thing. And I've got to do an oral cancer screen exam. I got to take your pictures. I got, I got 40 minutes and then I got to turn the room around. I got to clean the room. Shut up. Don't ask me any questions. If you had any questions, someone else is going to have to answer them because I don't have time. Right. So I think, and I did this in, in, um, in actually kind of a, uh, KOL's office. And he said, oh my gosh, Deborah, um, that was, don't wait till the end of the appointment, number one. So if I looked at your record, Kirk, and I see that we have treatment that we have, that we, uh, planned that you have yet to complete that's what I need to bring up first. And my body language has to be, I'm not looking at the computer. I'm not, my head isn't turned. I'm not putting down my instruments. I am looking you, not, I'm not giving you the ugly, I'm not mm -hmm. glaring at you, but I'm looking you in the eye and I say, Kirk, I see that we have treatment that we have planned for you that has yet to be completed. Tell me what's prevented you from having it done. Ooh, I like that. Tell me what has prevented you because now, now we have to train the hygienist because you're going to, you're going to say a couple of things. Doesn't hurt. Right. Expensive. Right. I don't have time. Yeah. And I really don't see the value. Those for me, people used to say there are three things. There's four things. I think there's four things. Yeah. No, go, keep going with that because, because that is such a brilliant question. Now, Deborah, no matter what I say, as a patient, that is, that's like the gift. I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. And you can take that and go, thank you so much. You don't have any time. Did you know, you know, X, Y, you can address that right on, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the fact that you ask, you know, you say, do you want to talk to a doctor about this day? Or, you know, he's going to talk to him. We have a tendency to throw it away. I'll tell, I have another great story about that. We have a tendency to throw it away. Right. So let's say you said, um, it's cost, you know, it's expensive and say, so, you know, Kirk, and good dentistry, exceptional dentistry is expensive. You're right. Um, Cause it needs to last. Uh, but think about this. Think about what it would have cost you five years ago when doctor originally treatment planned that for you. Think about what it might cost you five years from now. Right. It will never cost you less than now. Right. So if we could find a way to, to, to make that work for you to, to factor that into your, into your budget, what other concerns do you have? Mm-hmm. So, I, okay. So Deborah, I'm, I'm, if I'm a dentist, I'm listening. I, I'm, you're talking to me. I got 2000 patients. You just called me out. Like I've got my hygienist have been working with me for 20 years. How do I change this? Okay. Starting oh, that's interesting. Through. Cause you know, it goes back to some doctors don't know how much unscheduled treatment they have in their records. That's why I know you and I both love analytics. I, I love dental Intel. I mean, I know there's others, you know, there's Blue IQ and Denimetrics and other ones. I happen to know and love Dental Intel. I mean, Dental Intel is not giving me anything um, to tell you this, but I love it when doctors see the report and they see how much unscheduled treatment is on their books. Some doctors don't know. Right. So one of the first things they should be doing is running a report of unscheduled treatment. And I'll be honest, most, a lot of softwares aren't comprehensive enough to give that data. 
So I think we need to back up and say, um, first of all, you know me, I have my two questions and my two questions work for almost everything. Number one, if we, if we enhance the, our communication skills and commit our patients of record to treatment, is it good for them that we're doing that? Or is this a bad thing? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? 100% is a good thing. It's a good thing. Okay. Then the next question is, is this a good thing for our practice? 100%. Yeah. Then why aren't we doing it? So if you ask, if you have to answer, no, is this good for our patient? No, it's terrible. Then don't do it. Right. Um, I mean, sometimes when we talk about, I mean, we're not going to get into it, but we talk about allowing patients to make small payments over a long period of time in-house. Is that good for the patient? No, because it's going to prevent them from wanting to come back. It's going to be then be reluctant to return for care. There's all kinds of reasons why it's not good for them. So don't do it. If it's yeah. not going to be good for the patient, don't do it. Um, yeah. And you mentioned two tools. I want you to go back to this. You and I are both big fans of Pearl. And then you also mentioned dental intel. Let's talk about dental intel first, because that's probably the easiest for those of you that use it in the morning huddle. It'll tell you how many patients are coming in that actually have treatment that they haven't moved forward on. Correct. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And I do believe I, I'm not sure that if they are now either working on it or if they have worked on it, that with some analytics and with some patient engagement systems, if the patient has already applied for care credit at their vet, or they bought a bed, or they are, or they have a Lowe's credit card, um, it will actually notation this patient already has a care credit account. Right. So you would actually even know if this patient has become um, used to uh, financing. Oh my gosh, we have to have we have I have to come back because Samir just had this brilliant conversation about um, open to buy and asking patients about credit card at, at at checkout at checkout. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. Yeah. But you know we'd have to yeah. see it again. So I think that's re what's really important is um, we sit down with our 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 uh, team. Here's here's you know I told you I don't like math, but let's let's say let's say we have two hygienists working and they see eight patients a day. Right. So that's going to be what that's going to be. And they work 200 days a year. Right. So that means we're going to have 3,200 visits per year. Yep. And we can divide that. We say, so that could say we about, we can say, well, that's would be about 1600 active patients possibly, but well, so we have the capacity for 3,200. See, that's the other thing we have to know. What's our capacity, but we right. have the capacity for 3,200 visits. Let's say that 10%, um, 10% of those patients are going to move forward with some level of treatment. And let's say it's the equivalent of $800. Yeah. That's another $128,000 per year. Into 100%. Yeah, absolutely. So we want to know where my, where my additional compensation is going to come from. It's going to come from that. Right. It's going to come, it, and, and, and uh, <laughs> it's less expensive to market to patients I already have. 100%. And wouldn't you agree with this? You've been in a lot of practice. There's usually over a million dollars if not oh, $2 yes. million dollars in a chart. And that hasn't even been diagnosed. Yes, yes. Because they, they go further down the apathy road. Of yes. That, don't you well, think? Well, and here's the, again, we, make, we sometimes make assumptions based on age, based on what we've talked about, based on what I know about this person, based right. on insurance restrictions. So a fun story. Um, <laughs> so I have a client and um, he gives me permission to tell the story. And they were doing the morning huddle. Hi, and I, I use this because it's it, it happens in every single dental office, Kirk. I know it does. They're looking at the morning huddle. They're looking at their records. And they said, oh, here's Mrs. Fedevesi. You know, she's been a patient for years. Little sweet thing. She has two crowns here on the upper left that need restorations. She hasn't. She's not interested in having them done. You know, she also has some stained anterior composites. But you know, Mrs. Fedevesi, she's not interested in doing those crowns. So she obviously is not interested in doing anything elective because she's not doing what is necessary. And so, all right, Mrs. Fedevesi is coming in. You're, this is going to be a quick exam, Dr. Johnson. You, you know, you're not going to spend a whole lot of time with her. Well, ha, 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 ha. Mrs. Fedevesi comes in. A hygienist goes in to get Dr. Johnson and she says, um, Dr. Steve, I don't want to alarm you. Before you go in there, you need to know. Mrs. Venevesi has 16 porcelain veneers. She's had the crowns done somewhere else. Wow. Well, 
after reviving him with an ammonia pellet, <laughs> he went in to do the exam and he said, Mrs. Fedevesi, your veneers are beautiful. And I'm so glad you finally had those crowns done. He said, may I ask you a question? And he was brave to do that. He right. said, can I ask you a question? Why didn't, why didn't you have us do this for you? And her answer was, I didn't know you did this. Yeah. No one ever talked to me about it. I knew I needed to have the two crowns done, but I also wanted to get rid of these old dirty. She said she called them old dirty fillings. I want to get rid of these old dirty fillings. And I knew my insurance wasn't going to cover it. So I knew I was going to have to save up the cash, the cash. I was going to, have to save up the money to, to be able to afford these. And I didn't want to do the crowns until I had the cash to do these because I wanted everything to match. My neighbor had the veneers done by her dentist. And that's where I went. Mm -hmm. And she, Dr. Johnson, if I had known, I would have been here. Yeah. That story happens everywhere all the time. Oh, Let me ask you another yeah. question on that story. How many patients have come to Ross that have a dentist that have flown in and you go, okay, well, you have a dentist. Why are you here? And what do they say? It says, my dentist doesn't do this or I'm, or my dentist doesn't have the reputation for doing this. Here's the other scary part. We've had dental team members from other offices come and have Dr. Nash do their work. Wow. That is scary. That's scary. So yeah. what are they to, what are they going to tell the patients when they go and we've actually had patients come to us and say, well, my hygienist told me I should come here to have it done. That's a problem. It is a problem. That's a, it is a that's problem. A, that's a whole other. Yeah. So I will tell you that I'm married to the man cannot change the roll of toilet paper. And sometimes he drives me cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but he is so integrous. And he, if that's, if, if he, if he feels compelled to keep them, he will, but oftentimes he will say, you know, I know your dentist could do this for you. I know right. he could do this for you. And he's actually got into dentist office and say, you know what, I'm going to come and shadow you. I'm going to come and watch. And why don't we do this together? So right. you and I, or he'll invite the patient, the doctor to come in and do it together. So right. not everybody's that way. Yeah. And I want to go back to something that you and I both believe in. So you mentioned Pearl. So yes. that's a, that's an easy low hanging fruit tool that you can easily put in place. Can you explain what it is and how it would work if I'm in this situation? Okay. Well, Pearl is what is called second opinion. So it is artificial intelligence. That's actually reading the radiographs, not with your naked subjective eye, but with an analytical techno technological eye. So it becomes a second opinion for the patient. It's also a great visual for the patient. And knowing that patients, 50% of, of, of the population are visual learners right. for them to be able to see. Because sometimes we put those radiographs up and for all they know, they're looking at an ink blot. They, they don't know what we're looking at. They don't see what we're looking at. But when you bring Pearl up and Pearl says, oh, we see decay here and it colors it and it circles it and it says, okay, this is... 35% um, into the dentin. It actually gives percentages. This is, you know, 25%. You've got calculus and calculus is, is you know, into, into the tissue by X percent. Man, it is hard to dispute that. I mean, a patient could dispute, but it doesn't hurt. A patent, patient could dispute, my gums don't bleed. But when you're looking at that visual chart, that you know, artificial intelligence has picked up is pretty hard to dispute. I remember, you know, Ross and, and um, our new owner have, a, and I say our because they retained me now. Is now I'm the retained <laughs> consultant for the practice. They're not letting um, you go either. Right? I know. So the pay. I remember a patient walking out. His name is Steve, and and um, I said Steve, and he says, "Damn that pearl." I said, "What?" He says, "Yeah." He goes, "I know I needed that crown, but how can I dispute? How can I argue with artificial intelligence?" Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. At the very least, the other thing, let me back up because the other oh, thing that Pearl does in the morning huddle, because I know we talked about the Dell and Tell, the morning huddle for Dell and Tell. Pearl also, you use it in the morning huddle because it will actually determine here are the patients that are scheduled today, and here are the patients who need radiographs. Here are the patients who haven't had uh, current radiographs um, in, at their regular interval. Yeah, so it has they, multiple, multiple benefits. One of them, I mean, one of the ones that we could talk about today is calibrating everyone clinically on your team. Yes. Because you talk to your, even your hygienist and your assistants and everyone, it takes all the subjectivity out of it away. Yeah. And yeah. it's very hard to argue with data. Wouldn't you Well, agree? it goes back to, you know, um, what, not belaboring the situation, but, you know, people who know me know I had a tumor in 2011. So how did they find it? Did they find it by poking in my head? Did no. they find it by, they found it with an MRI. 
Yeah. Um, so if they had to go in, they'd go inside. Well, of course, they didn't get it all. So I've, so this is a perfect example. So they didn't get it all because uh, it was attached to a blood vessel. So I have to go in for recall. I have to go in and have a new bait. And this is what we talk about recall renewal. I'll go back to that. I have to have new baseline, a new baseline MRI at regular intervals to determine has it has the tumor that they didn't get, has it grown at all? Well, it's grown twice. They've had to have radiation twice. Um, they call it bulging. I don't, I'd rather call it growing, but they call it bulge. You know, your tumor's bulged. So um, they gather new baseline data, you know, at, at a regular interval. So here's what we tell the patient. And and it, once again, it had to be with an MRI. So you could right. see here's, here's, you know, the brain, the whole brain doing the thing. So one of the things we say to the patient during the recall renewal exam, it is time for us to gather new baseline data. I mean, if you've ever had a colonoscopy or a mammogram or an MRI measuring things, they want your baseline and then they want to measure your current against the baseline radiographs or the baseline images that they have. So we say to the patient, it's really time for us to gather new baseline data. Yeah, I could go off on an hour on this whole concept that you brought to us, Deborah. Um, one of the things, again, going back to dental intel, is annual patient value. All of our coaches know when annual patient value is low, the dentistry is not very good. You know, you have all these patients, and the average value per patient is down in the 400s or 500s. They're just doing fast, quick, low, low quality dentistry. But as it gets closer to a thousand dollars, or even way more than that, you're starting to see more comprehensive dentistry. Do you find the same? Absolutely. And I, and I think one of the ways, you know, um, that I think the doctors, when you take a look at how to increase their revenue, one of the, one of the ways of doing that is you say, you look at what I call your um, HPA, your highly productive activities. What Ooh. are your highly productive, your HPA, what Tell are your more. highly productive activities that yield the most productivity in, the, in your office? Um, so, uh, you know, I do, um, I'm white labeled for another consulting company and I go and I lecture and they always ask the young doctors, what do you think your highest paid activities are in your office? And they say new patient exams. And it's not no. new patient exams aren't your highest, your highly productive activities. What's it going to be now? It's going to be, you know, it's going to be for, for, you know, if we want to talk about lab, it could it'd be crown and bridge. The other thing we, we talk about, you know, if you're doing CIRAC and if you're doing, in office crowns, it's it be it's, it could be a highly productive activity. Quadrant dentistry, highly productive activity. Single unit restorations, not a highly productive activity. Ross just did four direct restorations on a, a patient. It's a highly productive activity at twelve hundred dollars a tooth. Yeah. You know, it's a that's a highly productive activity. So, right. what are my highly productive activities, and are we doing are we doing them? What is our what's our service mix? Right. The service mix. And you're pointing to a whole nother thing. We should do a whole show on this one too. Like every business is pretty much the same. You have a service and you charge a fee per service. So you've seen this people say, well, I'm a cosmetic dentist. You're like, okay, great. Well, how many veneers did you do? One. I did one last year. And you know, every little bit yeah. more that you do in the HPA times a fee that's related to the HPA lends itself to a healthier, more productive. And well, it also goes patient. back to when you talk about fees, when was the last time the doctor um, reviewed his or her fees. So, you know, buy the NDA book and see where you fall into the percentile. Right. Um, you can buy it, the book and it'll tell you where you are. And we actually, you know, we, we reviewed it when, you know, Dr. Wormlinger was reviewing the fees. And he says, wow, you know, when we're talking about your CT scan, how much, what's the 90th percentile for CT scans? So, so many doctors um, are, are concerned about, do I raise my hygiene fees? Um, will it, will, it, will my patients turn away? Not if you're doing a great service, right. you know, if, once again, if you're charging $125 or $135, $150 for a recare examination, you can't be doing a dine and dash exam. In fact, here's an, oh my gosh, see, here's another point. So many times patients will say, I only want my teeth cleaned. I don't want an exam. Mm. Well, I would say, well, you need to figure out if you've got patients saying, I don't want an exam. Why is that? And then I, I ask audiences, why do you think the patient says they don't want to have a, rec a recall examination? They say, some people say they don't want to find anything. They don't want you to find anything wrong. I say, eh. And then some people say, because they don't want to pay for it. Why don't they want to pay for it? Because they don't want to pay for it. They don't see value. Yeah. You've, you, this is not an accident when that happens. There's, they're getting clues to 
prompt them to say that? Yeah, so I probably don't want uh, uh, to come in and have a hygiene or have a, uh, an examination because I'm getting the one that John described. I'm getting, we're going to talk about cats and TikTok and <laughs> We're, you know, we're talking about car the construction. We're not talking teeth. So why am I paying one hundred fifty dollars to talk about my cat? I, right. Why am right. I doing that? I, I don't want to do that. Clean my teeth. And if you're not going to have a conversation with you about my teeth, then let me get out of there. Right. I'll go have a drink with you at the bar. We can talk about our cats. All right. So I'm listening to this as a dentist. I'm totally picking up what you're putting down, Deborah. You don't have to get this perfect, right? I can just you you can just get started on this start with one patient a day heck who cares one like, patient a day somewhere. and ask the magic question i see that you have treatment that was treatment plan that we have yet to complete right. tell me what has prevented you from having that done mm -hmm. and then your hygienist needs to you know rather than saying you know they have to be comfortable having the answer you know well gee it's you know that's a lot of money it is a lot of money isn't it yeah. think about what it would have cost you five years ago and what it'll cost you five years from now what it would cost you today. It'll never cost you less than right now. So let's say it's, you know, it's fear. Um, to help me understand what you're fearful of. Are you fearful of the discomfort of the, of the treatment? Are you discomfort of the procedure? Imagine if you're fearful of the discomfort of the procedure, imagine what it would feel like if you do nothing and it gets worse and it starts causing you pain. So we could talk about that fear. It's not bothering me right now. That is, yeah. So when we talk about, we could actually solve a number of things. If you're, if you're afraid of discomfort and you're afraid of cost, then the most important thing, um, when, we, when we talk about now that's not bothering you, this is what is the cost you the least and the, be, and the, be, the, be the least uncomfortable. Yeah. And all you need is just a few successes. Not everybody's going to say yes, but you have one or two say yes during a week. You're like, wow, I'm helping people. And it starts yeah. to dispel this whole story. You got, you know, I think the big thing here too, Deborah, you got to stop telling yourself, everybody hates coming here. Everybody thinks dentistry is too expensive. You got to change the way you think, right? Follow me. Two things. First of all, you have to be careful that it doesn't sound like you're supersizing. Hey, right. you want a crown with that cleaning today? Hey, you want a right. whitening? You got to be careful. But here's the other piece. You've seen that cycle, the belief cycle. You've heard of the belief cycle. So if I believe the patient doesn't want it, if I believe the patient isn't interested, if I believe the patient can't afford it, I'm going to behave in a way that I believe. So I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to, I'm my, my actions are going to perpetuate my belief. And my belief is a patient doesn't want it, doesn't care about it. So my actions are going to perpetuate what I believe and my results are going to perpetuate my belief. So I knew they didn't want it. I knew they weren't interested. I knew they couldn't afford it. See, I was right. Right. Bam. Drop the mic. That is so true. So, so true. if I believe I am doing a good, you know, when people talk about selling dentistry, you know what we're doing? We are, we're not selling like we're selling a bad car, a bad used right. car to people. You know what we're doing? We're letting, helping our patients improve their dental health and their dental appearance. Um, we're, we're helping them prove in terms of, of periodontal disease. I had to tell you, um, we had a patient who came in yesterday and she was diagnosed having her veneers done in another office for less money. I mean, big, big less money. I mean, I'll be part of my sleep. She was, she was treatment plan for, to do veneers for $700 wow. in another office. We charged $2,500. And she came in here because she said she just had a feeling. She was just something about the process. There was something about it. She just didn't feel good about it. And, you know, she kind of, she Googled us and she decided that maybe she should go somebody, you know, who was accredited. But here was the other reality. That doctor, oh, oh I had to say this. The doctor was ready to do veneers and Dr. Nash said, um, Deborah, she opened her mouth and her breath was so bad. I said, oh, she has perio. He says, big time. Wow. And I told her, I cannot, I cannot treat, I cannot do these veneers for you until we address your disease. Right. Someone was ready to do veneers on the, and, and he says, he said, it will just, it would make the situation worse. Why would I put pretty teeth in, in a diseased mouth? Totally. Totally agree. Totally so agree. I think it goes back to belief. Right. So, you know, if you believe that the patient is interested, you believe the patient can afford it. You believe the patient wants it. You may not be right all the time. I, this is, I, I'm not going to be religious, but I'll never forget this. I went to church a couple of weeks ago and um, the, the pastor we were talking about, should you, should you, or should you not believe in God? You know, like, it, is there a God? Should you believe in their God? And, and um, he said, 
um, there's a famous philosopher, and I can't quote the philosopher, but he said, the philosopher said, you know what? What have you got to lose? Right. Absolutely. <laughs> what have you got to lose? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't, and there is, yikes. But if yeah. you do, and there is, you're better yeah. for it. So I think it's like, what have you got to lose by saying to the patient, um, help me understand, you know, that other, help me understand why we haven't been able to do this for you. What has prevented you from moving forward with your care? Yeah. I, and you say it with sincerity. I love it. I love it. I think we're just, you know, as, as you've already said, so many dentists are sitting on a gold mine. Gold mine. And, and they just have to see it. And they're chasing new patients. Right. They're chasing new patients. So, you know, I've talked about this before about the doctor who called me wanting, looking for a, a consultant. And he said, I get 35 new patients a month, solar practitioner. And he said, I get a hundred percent case acceptance rate, which uh, right, right then I thought, mm, well, you don't, but okay. So I said, well, tell me the average value per patient. If you get a hundred percent, that's amazing. Right. Tell me the average value per patient. He said, $400 a patient. There, so do you want 35 new patients at with a value of $400 a patient, or would you rather or you want he wanted 50? I said, Do you want 50 new patients with a value of $400, or would you rather have 30 new patients with a value of $1,400? Right, right, it, yeah. And at the end of the day, I know you agree with this like, just do the right thing all the time and try to get people to he healthy and get them optimally healthy. All of that takes care of itself. Well, I mean, once again, we could do this whole thing for um, for language skills. You know, yeah. don't tell the patient what they need. Say, would you allow me to tell you what I would like to do for you? Oh my so gosh. we're going to give you information to help you choose as opposed to, I'm going to tell you what you need. And then uh, Marilyn is going to go over what your insurance is going to cover and how you can take your, she's going to talk to you about the financial policy, all these Things, you know, I'm going danger, Will Robinson, danger, Will Robinson in my head. Those are things you don't say, you don't use. So I can say, Kirk, I'm going to give you information to help you make the right choices for your care. Yeah, that's why you guys, if, you, if you're listening, that's why she's the best at this. We're going to oh. do a whole episode on that one question, because that's truly one of my favorite. You're just setting the bar. So number one, you're opening up the conversation yes. about possibilities. Yes. You know, and once again, and, when you say opening up the conversation, we, we, you know, we could do a whole segment on body language. My body must also reflect that I am totally engaged. And I'm totally intentional with the question. If right. it's a throwaway question while I'm doing something else, if I'm, you know, setting up or I'm, you know, I'm on the computer, it, then it doesn't have the same merit that when I'm sitting there with an engaged and with an intentional listening ear, this is an important question. This is a critical, this is not a throwaway. Yeah. Deborah, you are the best. I want you to talk about uh, all the things you're up to, but like, uh, we're going to, I'm going to have you back again and again and again. I know um, we just have so much fun. I know. I love it. I love it. You guys, you think this is fun. You should go to dinner with her. It's so <laughs> much fun. Like it's, I, I left that one night with you and Roy. I laughed so hard. My stomach hurt. My face hurt. Um, the waiter was like, it was so much fun. So we, um, well, we engaged the waiter, which once again, yeah. 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 So any last thoughts you have on the recall renewal exam? I think what's really important is um, th for those who are listening is to have a strength of conviction. When you listen to this podcast and you go back and say, you know what, we're going to not let's try this or what do you think? Let's do this. There's a big yeah. difference as opposed to let's try. What do you think about? And then, you know what, let's do this. Let's pick out some patients in the morning huddle and say, this patient would be a great candidate for the, this new skill, yeah, for this new approach. Yeah. I tell my kids all the time, Yoda said, there is no try. There is only do <laughs> or do not. There's no, yes. like I tried it. So uh, yeah. I love this. Now, Deborah, I want you to talk about your business courses. I want you to talk about your consulting, your speaking. Um, if I want to find out more about you, how do I find out more about what you do? Where do I go? Oh, well, you can go. Actually, I'm designing a brand new website now. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, yeah. So I mean, but my old website's still working. So um, you can I can give you my phone number, and I usually use my cellular number because I never know where I am. I'm sometimes in Charlotte, I'm sometimes not. So my cell number is 704-904-3459. Um, that's my cell phone and, and my email is Deborah Engelhart Nash at gmail.com. It's weird because it's D E B R A, not the other way. It's E N G E L 
H-A-R-D-T, N-A-S-H at gmail.com. See, I try and use all the letters of the alphabet in my name. I need to come up with a Z. Um, yeah. Um, and I mean, go on my website, my website's the same, Deborah Englehart Nash, um, dot com. Yeah. It's actually getting a facelift right now. I'm so excited about it. I can't wait to see it. So yeah, I now, know. if you guys aren't taking notes, we're taking notes for you. You can flip up to the notes in Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, whatever you listen to Apple, uh, you can see, uh, all of Deborah's information. You can click right on it yeah. send an email. We're doing, a, we're doing a dental business school at the Nash Institute in June. Tell me so, what that is. Like, tell tell the listeners what that is. So I always say, I always say it's like from phone, it's from phone, first phone call to recall. It's two days of of training on from the moment the patient walks into the to um, how you're scheduling them, how you're having a conversation with them, presenting treatment, financial arrangements, and moving them into the into the recare. It's all about the systems of uh, patient. Uh, operations. It's also revenue cycle management. I co-teach with Penny Reed, who's a stitch and a half. That's awesome. Um, it's like it's like Lucy and Ethel teaching this class. Um, she is brilliant. Um, so she and I co-teach this. So we talk a lot about analytics. Uh, we talk about you know revenue cycle management, practice management. Uh, we talk about overhead analysis as well as the people skills of this beautiful profession that we uh, are blessed to be working with. Yeah, I'm going to encourage you guys. You've got to take. I I want to take that course. You got to check out Deborah's stuff. If if you don't go do her business courses, but then also too, if you see her on the road, just pop into one of her rooms. You'll be wildly entertained. You'll yeah. take a ton of notes, and this stuff really will help you improve your practice. It works. In your life. It works. It does. It does. It works. Yeah. yeah. You know, if somebody's, I'll tell you that I think the important thing if. Um, there's so many things that you can say, and I always have kind of a, in the closing slide that won't work. Our patients are different. We're different. We don't have enough time. You, you can perpetuate that behavior or you can be more successful and you can say, you know what? It's working somewhere. We can make it work here. Love it. It's Love working. It. it works for uh, somewhere. We can make it work. We're bright people. Yep. We're entrepreneurial people. We're committed people. We're passionate. We want to do what's best for our patients. And what's doing best for our patients is giving them the opportunity to choose the beautiful care that we can provide. 100%. You are such a gift to this profession. Uh, Debra, I'm grateful a, to call you my friend. So thank you so much. So thank you. A lot of my team members okay, say, wait, oh, wait. you get to see Kirk. They love you. Oh, well, we love you too. So yeah. wait, stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening or watching the big best practices show wherever you're consuming the podcast. I just want to thank you guys. I'm going to have Deborah back again and again and again. So let us know the topics you want to cover. I'll just ask her the questions and we'll get it straight from the expert. So keep sending us suggestions for things you guys want to see. And until we see you next time, or you hear from us next time, keep watching, or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day.